Do not feel safe, the poet remembers. The title of our series of talks about Polish poems is Poetry in the Time of War. The time of war is now, and the time of war is always. A tragic truth cruelly reminded us by the war in, in Ukraine. Poetry has often responded to war, to any form of violence, with defiance or resignation, with stoicism or anger, and sometimes by directing our gaze, our attention beyond war, violence, pain, towards greater and more uh, permanent things. Today we would like to talk about the poem to Marcus Aurelius by the Polish poet Zbigniew Herbert. Our guest is an American poet, essayist and fiction writer, winner of the, the 2020 Roma Jaffe uh, Wright Foundation Writers Award, Ms. Elisa Gonzalez. Her work appears in the New York, uh, New York Magazine and elsewhere. So uh, good morning, Mrs. Gonzalez. And uh, can we uh, talk um, about uh, Zbigniew Herbert? Could you read maybe for the beginning his poem, we choose them to Mark Aurelius? Yes, thank you for having me. Um, to Marcus Aurelius and to Professor Henrik Elsenberg. Uh, I'm reading the translation by Elisa Ballas um, in the collected poems of the Dignity of Herbert. Good night, Marcus, put out the light and shut the book. For overhead is raised a gold alarm of stars. Heaven is talking some foreign tongue. This, the barbarian cry of fear, your Latin cannot understand. Terror, continuous dark terror against the fragile human land begins to beat. It's winning, hear its roar. The unrelenting stream of elements will drown your prose until the world's four walls go down. As for us, to tremble in the air, blow in the ashes, stir the ether, gnaw our fingers, seek vain words, drag off the fallen shades behind us. Well, Marcus, better hang up your piece. Give me your hand across the dark. Let it tremble when the blind world beats on senses five like a failing lyre. Traitors, universe and astronomy, reckoning of stars, wisdom of grass, and your greatness too immense, and Marcus, my defenseless tears. Thank you so much. When do, did you read this poem first time? Do you remember? Um, I think I actually must have read it probably in 2014 in a class that I took with Edward Hirsch, who I know that you have also mm -hmm. spoken to for this series. Um, and he was my introduction to Polish poetry and to um, specifically Herbert's poetry, which I think we both shared like a, a deep and special love. I mean, there are many Polish poets that I love, but sometimes someone speaks mm -hmm. to your soul in a way that you really can't get out of, you know, can't get out of the conversation, want to continue further. Um, it was interesting to uh, reread this poem in this context, like for the series as well, um, because, you know, as you said, war is kind of always there. Um, but at the same time, I, you know, it's been brought to us in a present tense, very close to Poland, the current war in Ukraine. Um, so it does, I feel like the context for it does change. Um, and uh, so as with uh, my understanding, and please correct me if I ever say anything wrong, um, uh, my understanding is that um, 
you know, as with many of Herbert's poems, this the kind of classical resonances and references like specifically interact with the contemporary or, you know, at the time Polish context, um, or perhaps more broadly, like the Western context at times. Um, and so the kind of introduction of the classics is one way to um, layer meaning and contrast and analogy onto other situations in politics and war, um, which is, I think, fascinating here. I mean, the double dedication of Marcus Aurelius and Henrik Elsenberg. And I know that he originally, Herbert originally sent the poem to Elsenberg in a letter. Um, and uh, Elsenberg wrote a book about Marcus Aurelius. So clearly there's like a there's a kind of double line of communication here um, for a, a poem that is to addressed to a figure in the past and a poem that is also being sent to a person in the present whose work and whose ability to speak is being oppressed by the um, communist government at that time. Um, is that all right? If I, if I may ask, um, mm -hmm. am I, um, because I, I don't know if, you, if the, the camera switched. No, I don't you see are, myself. You are on. You are on. I am right. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, so Marcus Aurelius was uh, a Stoic philosopher, uh, and, and sometimes Herbert is considered a Stoic writer. But is this is this poem uh, a poem about Stoicism, uh, or maybe it is against Stoicism, because because at the end, you know, this this distance this piece breaks down and the, the poem becomes gasping almost you know it's like a growing uh, raising crescendo uh, in in it and how, how do you how do you see it yeah i think that's a good question it's one that i was asking myself because i also went back to the meditations a little bit and i know he's not like necessarily referring to anything specific in there but was trying to think through this i mean it it i feel to some extent that it is a kind of imagined Marcus Aurelius, like a, a figure that he can relate to more closely, one under immense pressure. Um, but certainly at the, I mean, the beginning starts, although it is calm with good night, Marcus mm. without the light, but shut the book does seem to suggest that there's some kind of insufficiency or something being questioned to me about what is in the book, you know, like in the book of poetry, in the book of language, in within Stoic philosophy, certainly. Um, and then, you know, the gold alarm of stars, like that, mm, yes. that image, um, heaven is talking some foreign tongue, like we're already out of the realm of kind of human language, mm. as well as, um, you know, alarm, of course, has a very specific meaning if you like been in a war i mean there you know we and heaven is talking some foreign tongue i'm not sure that he's explicitly referring to bombs falling but that could be one way yeah. that someone's memory could access it um and then this the barbarian cry of fear your latin cannot understand um and i saw that some scholars had quibbled with the fact that the meditations were written in greek but i think it's i I doubt that's like an error of Herbert's as much as it is a kind of call to like more a more general like Latin idea mm. of civilization. Um, and then the terror, continuous dark terror, that repetition, like it, it really, this poem like kind of very quickly intensifies, I think. And terror also um, against the fragile human land begins to beat it's winning, hear its roar. And this is, I, I think, so fascinating to me because I do feel so often in Herbert's poems, uh, a resistance to the idea that it's winning, that, you know, terror, war, yeah. darkness can win, that not that he denies their existence or the difficulty of living with them, but when he talks about poetry and in some of his poems or about classical models, um, it is often with the sense that they can be drawn upon that there is some sort of order that can structure our kind of like present tense experience of chaos and suffering. Um, but here, you know, it, it seems extremely despairing. The unrelenting stream of elements will drown your prose until the world's four walls go down. I mean, that's apocalyptic yes. and it's an apocalypse of language. Like, it, it, you know, he's not even talking about death. He's talking about the death of the words 
and whatever wisdom is contained within them. Um, and of course, I'm I'm hearing this in like multiple levels. Like there's, you know, what is contained in meditations or, or contained in philosophy, also perhaps what's contained in Elsenberg's work on aesthetics and philosophy, and also Herbert's own work or kind of poetry at large. Like what is language doing against this? And that question then, as for us is so brilliant I mean and then the break because it you know as for us like what of us um to tremble in the air blow in the ashes stir the ether gnaw our fingers seek vain words drag off the fallen shades behind us it's a I think a fairly typical move in Herbert to have a series of um you know the unpunctuated line that has discrete sentences or almost sentences in it um but that that repetition it's all um it's all of uselessness and also of contact with um, with emptiness in some way. Like the most tangible image there is not our fingers, which I mean, if you're thinking about who is doing the writing, it, it really feels like you're saying I've given up on the pen, you know, like or I'm in such a state of extremity in what in what such case yeah. would you gnaw your fingers um, and drag off the fallen shades behind us. Obviously, like there we're in very close contact with death, although still um, I don't know what it is in the Polish because um, I don't have it in front of me, but um, the shades are also reminiscent of classical times, you know, of, of the underworld. And then again, in that last thing, I mean, the the only image of consolation, I think, is in the last stanza, well, Marcus, better hang up your piece, which is not a consolation, it's a sort of reiteration of that beginning, put out the light, shut the book, um, and a rejection, perhaps, of the piece that can be found in a, in a stoic response to things. Um, but then give me your hand across the dark is a very beautiful image of connection despite it being you know in the darkness mm. so i feel that if there is a hope in the poem it is in that very fragile stretched across a void uh connection between two people or the layers of people that we have seen in the poem um, but the hand is still trembling when the mm. world beats and we have the failing liar like again the end of music um, and that final condemnation as traitors, you know, the universe and astronomy, it's a kind of funny combination, but I think, you know, there's a sort of like sense in which it seems to be uh, condemning the ability to perhaps read the natural world as ordered or in some way also as consolation. Um, your greatness to immense and Marcus my defenseless tears is such a deeply moving ending and I do think that the um that perhaps and I would love to hear any of your thoughts about this um that the greatness that is 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 too immense is it's like it, perhaps that philosophy or the consolations of stoicism cannot be accessed at that particular moment they are it's too immense to be present in the life of the or the mind of the person speaking and in fact like the only uh thing that can be found are are those defenseless tears that yeah. um turn to absolute emotion um the defenselessness um i think is particularly interesting because the emphasis on um well, of course, like within the context of like war or conflict or suppression, like defense is, um, you know, can take myriad forms, but it is certainly almost always necessary for people to survive in, in these circumstances. But it seems a moment of absolute vulnerability, I guess is what I mean. And it's interesting to me to frame that within, um, you know, at the, which is one of Herbert's many like incredibly interesting moves to like frame this not as um, an explicitly like personal reflection, like a lyric address to anyone um, or, a, you know, the kind of effusion of the self, but to put that in the context of a possible conversation with classical philosophy and with a friend. Um, so there, there's a very complex communication of that vulnerability, I think. Um, and it's an interesting texture in, in Herbert where I, I do think you don't necessarily see hope, but you see 
often more like in why the classic for instance like often a more um kind of measured uh yeah. like dealing with suffering um, yeah it's it's something that happens quite often in uh in herbert's poems and people sometimes do not notice it that there's like stepping down from this you know the altar of civilization mm -hmm. to the human human order and it ends not on philosophical tone but a very human tone trembling uh defenselessness at hand human hand give me a hand give me your hand you know this this is the only thing that that matters Margarita, any questions for me? Oh, that was great uh, re reading of uh, speaking of Herbert's poem. Um, for me, also, it was about the, especially the last um, the last uh, line was about um, the victim being a victim of circumstances, being a victim in the world. Somehow, I read it this way, but mm. I. Um, so I want to, to ask you, because in your poem recently uh, published in New York, uh, the New York magazine, the New Yorker magazine, congratulations on that in your oh, new poem. You, um, you uh, actually invoked uh, Zbigniew Herbert's line from other, the other poem of his. So maybe we can go into, thank you so much for this interpretation. It was very deep. Um, and when we, maybe we can go to your new poem and please, could you read it to us? Uh, sure. Mm -hmm. um, after my brother's death, I reflect on the Iliad. The water cuts out while shampoo still clogs my hair. The nurse who swabs my nose hopes I don't have the virus, it's a bitch. The building across from the cemetery calls itself life storage. My little brother was shot, I tell the barista who asks how things have been and tip extra for her inconvenience. We speak only to the dead, someone tells me, to comfort, I assume, or inspire, but I take it literally as I am wont. Even my shut up and fuck and let's cook tonight, those are for you, Stephen. You won't come to me in my dreams, so I must communicate by other avenues. A friend sends an image from Cy Twombly's 50 Days at Ilium, a red bloom, the words like a fire that consumes all before it, and asks, have you seen this? It's at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. If I have, I can't remember, though I did visit with you when you were 11 or 12, when you tripped silent alarm after silent alarm, skating out of each room as guards jostled in and I, though charged with keeping you from trouble, joined the game. And the whole time we never laughed, not till we were released into the grand air we couldn't touch and could. You are dead at 22. As I rinse dishes, fumble for my keys, buy kale and radishes. In my ear, Priam repeats, I have kissed the hand of the man who killed my son. Would I do that? I ask as I pass the store labeled signs, signs. I've studied the mugshot of the man who killed you. I can imagine his hands. Of course I would. Each finger even to hold your body again and to resurrect you. Who knows what I am capable of if I were. Nights I replay news footage, your blood on asphalt, sheen behind caution tape. Homer similes, I've been told, are holes cut in the cloth between the world of war and another more peaceful world. On rereading, I find even there a man kills his neighbor. Let Achilles cut me down as soon as I have taken my son into my arms and have satisfied my desire for grief. This, my mind's new refrain in the pharmacy queue in the train's rattling frame. The same friend and I discuss a line by Zbigniew Herbert, where a distant fire is burning like a page of the Iliad. It's nearly an ontological question, my friend says, the instability of reference, the fires in the pages of the poem, the literal page set of fire, we see double. You are the boy in the museum, you are the body consumed ash. Alone in a London museum, I saw a watercolor of twin flames one black, one a gauzy red, only to learn the title is Boats at Sea. 
it's like how sometimes I forget you're gone, but it's not like that, is it? Not at all. When in this world, similes carry us nowhere. And now I see again the boy pelting through those galleries, a boy not you, a flash of red, red, chasing or being chased, or did I invent him? Mischief companion, brother. Listen to me, plead for your life, though even in the dream, I know you're already dead. How do I ensure my desire for grief is never satisfied? Was Priam's ever? I tell my friend, I want the page itself to burn. Thank you. Wow, this is, this is a powerful poem. Thank you. Um, I, th I thought it was actually, I mean, it does explicitly quote uh, the John and Bogdana Carpenter translation of three poems by Hart, which I think there will be more to say about that. Um, but I did think it had uh, an interesting resonance with uh, to, to Marcus Aurelius as, as well. And this sense that, um, and I do think that to some extent, my, my studies of Herbert have like moved me in this, this direction, this, um, the attempt to deal with human grief by looking for, um, it's not really like help, but by kind of interpreting and analogizing and, and seeking to engage um, like classical or, or art in general um, and bring it into the kind of thinking and feeling that the poet can do on the page. Um, and my poem is obviously laden with uh, classical <laughs> references and mm -hmm. specific quotes, but also with Herbert and with and with visual art, which he also, you know, was very interested in and wrote amazingly about as well. Um, so, uh, but they, I also think, you know, as we just discussed, both poems are ending not in order, but in a kind of cry to uh, from a defenseless position, you know, in my case, defenseless against a particular grief and Herbert's against perhaps a more general social grief that is still felt very personally. Um, I think victim of circumstance, um, Magajada, you said, um, was, uh, was, is another word that seems like to come to mind here that like there's a, perhaps a similar grappling um, through texts and art with something which, you know, you have no control over, but feel the victim of. Um, and uh, yeah, it's very interesting. What is, you know, I, and I ap apologize for such a analytical question, you know, uh, in reference to very, very personal and very kind of, you know, raw feeling um, poem, but, uh, the role of those classical references, we know that Herbert does it all the time, you know, sometimes, you know, in order to step down and show that they are no longer holding up the, 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 the structure of our civilization. You're thinking about the poem is thinking about Iliad. Why Iliad of all places and, 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 and all the references in this particular context? What does it do? Does it provide some kind of relief uh, from the grief or what, what, what is, what, what is, what is the emotional role there? Yeah, it's a good question. And please don't apologize for any, any questions. Um, I think that, um, I mean, of course, to some extent you can't control your habits of mind. So I in fact started, I did start thinking about that, uh, line, the famous line of Priam's, I've kissed the hand of the man who killed my son, yes. shortly after my, my brother died um, last year. And I went back to the story because I, I, I remembered that line. I mean, it's even without, if you have not experienced like the death of a close family member or something, it's, it's a haunting line. Um, but I was also thinking about the ways in which um, in the Iliad, uh, you know, the performances of grief, those funerary rites mm. give structure to mourning, you know, Achilles goes mad, but then he does have to still bury Patroclus and part of Priam's, you know, desire, like, you know, the satisfaction of his desire for grief would be to be able to bury his son and give him the rights rather than have his son dragged around the city by Achilles more. So there's, you know, a kind of way in which like ritual structuring grief like provides some relief um 
and I, I was interested in that. And I, I think, um, because for, for me, that did not operate. I mean, perhaps because <laughs> the Greek rites were so much more uh, elaborate than contemporary American funeral rites. But also, I think there is there are specific concepts of death and of, you know, of glory and like proper burial and passing on that are no longer like they don't feel applicable. Um, but uh, but I was interested in that. And, and then when I came up, that idea of like my desire for grief can like a desire to grieve can exist and I mean it can be a kind of literal rather it can be the desire to perform the the appropriate rites but also a desire for a feeling and I thought that that was a kind of interesting doubling that perhaps I was inserting into the poem but that felt very relevant to me um and uh yeah, and then going back into it, I did I did wonder, um, like we do see these uh, in the Iliad, the, the funerary rites completed, but it isn't clear to me that it has kind of emotionally helped, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the yes. whole structure of the book mm -hmm. is um, war, I mean, there's so much death, but you know, like the war doesn't end. It's just that we get these, yeah. this intense focus on the deaths. And I was also kind of curious about that, like, as if they have risen to outsized significance in the, even in the context of like a poem about the deaths of so many. Um, so I think, I think that those are kinds of primary things. Um, okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I. Um, this is a very powerful poem, and I'm sorry that uh, on your loss. Um, for me, it was this um, moment when you're coming from very intimate settings about your talking to the barista about the death mm -hmm. and the um, shampoo your hair, and then going into this. Um, Amnesian to the Iliad, to Sai Tombly, to the anger, because it's for me also, it was not only about the grief, it's about the anger. And it's the shield of Achilles and anger on death. So there is a lot of, um, it's a very beautiful poem. And um, there's a lot of uh, connections to, uh, not only to you, to, uh, to Iliad. So the site only 50 days are uh, at Iliam and the analysis is a fascinating series of uh, images. There's mm -hmm. the anger, the sh shield of Achilles, and there's the, um, you know, the reference to men anger and the war and the, then is the prime which is the grief. So mm -hmm. the connection between anger and grief you express so beautifully in this poem. And I really love like in the Herbert poem too, coming from this very intimate scene when Marcus Aurelius is laying down and closing the book and the lamp, the lamp is going off. But, and then suddenly we are under the sky full of uh, stars. So it's this metaphor is enormous, our place as a human being in the universe, how we can do it. And I think this is how I read your poem too, going from like shampoo, the hair, talking to barista, to being on the street to the museum of Philadelphia. Uh, I couldn't actually discover what uh, the, the painting of the two boats at sea, which you saw in London. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't find it, but the references to Sai Tumbley, thank you so much for that. It was really like, um, I'm fascinated by Iliad and uh, for Greek mythology. And that was the, re the reading this in paintings, in images, and you transporting it, like making this dialogue even more deeper and deeper. So thank you for oh, thank that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I did want um, that uh, tension between the everyday and the kind of mental life of grief and rage, but also like thinking about art even then. I mean, I think Herbert has uh, some quote yeah um 
from one of the short prose pieces um, for the task of great poetry as of all writing is to render justice to the visible world, justice and beauty. Um, and uh, he says, one could also write a book about what we Poles owe to poetry. I refer to the recent past. During the occupation, even the least sensitive people felt the true value of poetry. The partisan song was a shorthand for rage. The camp poem and I of hope, a few lines in a newspaper were a rhythmic pattern of our longing. But poetry cannot be an arc to help us survive the flood. It has to be our daily bread and article of primary human need. Um, Poetry is not some kind of trigonometric function. It's a human and arch human function. Um, and I, I think that that sort of like article of primary need was is also kind of, to me, I, I agree. And, um, and is also sort of present there that like, even in these circumstances of great trial, you don't forget about the other world of art. The other world of art is drawn into the, into your, daily reality um and uh, uh, oh i'm sorry please continue. yeah yeah he also the site only said that ancient things are new things the past is a springboard for me which i found it very interesting this kind of uh, relationship of uh, american contemporary american with the past with ancient greek so um yes yarku would you like to continue no no it's uh, it's fascinating you know listening listening to you reading reading polish po poetry and making those connections uh with uh your own life and your own experience uh how did it happen that you got interested in polish poetry because you were you're on a fulbright in in in, in poland right uh, yeah i did a, a fulbright in warsaw and i was working with uh katarzyna herbert and um the founding Fundacja Herberta, um, which was wonderful among among other things I was doing there, trying to <laughs> um, learn as much as possible was the main goal. Um, that I, I really do have to attribute it <laughs> primarily to Ed Hirsch. As I said, I took um, mm -hmm. I went to graduate school at NYU where he teaches a class on poetry and translation, and we read many wonderful poets. But I was particularly struck by poem I. I, my undergraduate education um, was at Yale, where I felt like I was very well educated, but it was primarily Anglophone, you know, and it, we didn't get very far outside the borders of like Western Europe. So I, you know, I had to educate myself later on a lot of things. Um, but again, it was it was through that. And then, you know, we read some poems in class and then I was like, where can I find more who are the best translators like yeah. how do I learn the history you know and that's been an ongoing project of the last oh, I don't know like eight years or something I mean I don't know so much but I'm constantly trying to accumulate knowledge and one of the first things I did was read you know all of all of Herbert and then continue that that path like reading again and again and trying to understand more as I became more familiar with history um and uh, it's the, uh, of course, I, I wish that I read better in Polish. I mean, my, when, when things calm down, I want to go back to Poland um, and uh, do an intensive language program, but so far my Polish is pretty pitiful. Um, but I know that the, Miłosz said something about Herbert being particularly well rendered in English, but I just suspect that the syntactic complexity is much more interesting and like and compelling even than in English in Polish. And of course, the distinction that, as yes. you had mentioned before we um, kind of began, uh, the distinction that Polish can make in like addresses and um, you know the singular yes. you versus the plural you, like English doesn't have that. So I, I always feel a bit robbed of richness there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I loved, I loved Poland and the language is beautiful. The poetry is extraordinary. So you, you found something, you found something in Polish, uh, uh, poetry that you did not see in, uh, Anglophone for poetry, for instance. I think, yes. And, um, I believe that it, well, I think the thing that I thought was so, that resonated for me so much with Herbert and then, uh, well, I'll confine myself to Herbert, but you know, we can 
think about Polish poetry at large, is the contact with history um, and the contact with art that is woven into life. And knowing that, um, you know, that he's very often, if not always, writing from a position of where there are some stakes to what he's saying, um, mm. where the, and the, the politics, like politics at large, like the social context in which we have to live cannot really be like mm. taken out of those poems. But at the same time, you know, as they're not didactic, like primarily, mm. nor are they, I, I think the thing that with Herbert, I always find so marvelous is that he can approach such a range of subjects at an angle, like can find these ways through persona or through object um, or through like analogy um, or, you know, even simple description that resonate on so much bigger than like what, you know, the ostensible perhaps focuses upon is. He is also of course capable of the, of the grand proclamation um, as well, but that, that kind of sliding in sideways into such territory is uh, is fascinating to me. Um, and I, I won't say it's like entirely absent from Anglophone poetry, but it does seem to reflect like a poetic genius working under particular historical pressures. Um, and I wanted to learn more specifically about that. I, you know, I wanted to try to understand better how is he even doing that, you know? Um, and like, what did it, what did it mean to him? Um, because I, I feel in Miłosz sometimes a deep resentment of the need to pay attention to war, you know, and politics and stuff yes. like there's, um, and I, I'm curious how you, how you see that. I don't feel it as strongly in Herbert or, or it's more subdued. It's like kind of woven into these things it's not taken so much as like explicit um i mean Miłosz literally writes poems about how he wishes that he could just be a poet out of history um but but this feels a bit different yeah well that's yeah. a huge subject of course i will actually be talking about herbert uh sometime next uh, semester right now after after other yeah. positions for mm -hmm. the shushka foundation you're welcome um well i think that Oh, do you have any? Um, no, it was uh, wonderful to hear you. Thank you so much for coming, uh, Ms. Gonzalez, and for um, beautiful poems and such a actually intellectual adventure into the poetry of speaking of Herbert. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. And it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.